Welcome to this lecture series on environment and ecology presented by Mentors for Eyes in association with Bangalore Eyes Academy and Nama KPSC. So in today's video, we'll actually be discussing biogeochemical or nutrient cycling. This is the second important function of an ecosystem, whereas the first important function that is energy flow has already been discussed. So <clears throat> while discussing about the ecosystem in the earlier videos, I did mention that it is made up of biotic components and abiotic components as well as the interaction between them. While discussing the components of the ecosystem, I have also mentioned that abiotic components both support and limit life and its diversity in the ecosystem. Therefore, for an ecosystem to support life, they must be, there must be energy flow which determines the metabolic rate as well as the availability of essential nutrients to support life which will determine the abundance of organisms and the complexity of ecosystems. Now, while discussing energy flow, I have also mentioned that energy flow in the ecosystem is always unidirectional and non-cyclical in the ecosystem. Meaning, as energy flows through the food chain, some amount of energy is always lost as heat. This energy which is lost as heat will not enter back into the food chain. Instead, the energy flowing through the food chain is always derived from the sun and this energy is not recycled. But this is not the case when it comes to nutrients where the nutrients can be recycled again and again. For example, through respiration when we breathe in oxygen we will release carbon dioxide whereas plants through photosynthesis use carbon dioxide and release oxygen and this cycle actually continues meaning the oxygen molecules which you are breathing could be the same oxygen molecules used by Lord Buddha around 2600 years back. The reason we have to study nutrient cycling is because elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and phosphorus makes up for around 97% of the mass of our bodies and more than 95% of the mass of all living organisms apart from several other elements essential for life. So, these nutrients or elements keep circulating or moving from non-living to living and living to non-living forming a cycle. So, Nutrient cycling is a concept which describes how nutrients move from a physical environment to the living organisms and subsequently recycle back to the physical environment. Since this nutrient cycling is important for life, it is an important function of the ecosystem. Therefore, the nutrient cycle in any ecosystem must be balanced and stable because if it is affected, life in the ecosystem itself will be affected. Now, in many books and sources, when reading or studying about nutrient cycling and biogeochemical cycling, the two terms, that is nutrient cycling and biogeochemical cycling, they are used synonymously. But biogeochemical cycling is actually a broader concept which includes other cycles like rock cycles for example which do not have a direct bearing on life or the functioning of organisms. But for our sake we will consider nutrient and biogeochemical cycles to be synonymous. Uh, the other point that I want you to remember is that these nutrient cycles are always closed loops or closed circuits. This is one important point please remember I will repeat the nutrient cycles are generally closed loops or closed circuits. So moving on ahead, the nutrient cycles are of two types. One is sedimentary cycle, the other is gaseous cycle. The sedimentary cycle is where the reservoir of the nutrients is the earth's crust. Also sedimentary cycles are known as imperfect cycles 
because some of the nutrients gets logged away into sediments and become unavailable for immediate cycling. Examples sulfur, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, etc. The other type of nutrient cycle is gaseous cycle. Gaseous cycle is where the reservoir is the earth's atmosphere or the hydrosphere. The gaseous cycle is a perfect cycle as the nutrients are replaced fast as they are utilized. I hope you are able to uh, identify the differences between the two. Sedimentary cycles are where the reservoir of the nutrients is the earth's crust and sometimes nutrients gets logged away and is not available for use for a considerable period of time, sometimes even millions of years. Now, when this is compared to gaseous cycles, the reservoir of the nutrients is the atmosphere or the hydrosphere and since the reservoir is the hydrosphere or the atmosphere, it is easily available for use, unlike the sedimentary cycles. Therefore, the sedimentary cycles are also known as imperfect cycles, whereas gaseous cycles are known as perfect cycles. So, in this particular video, I will only be discussing sedimentary cycles, whereas in the next video, I will cover up gaseous cycles. So, when it comes to new, uh, sedimentary cycles, I want you to remember, generally, the sedimentary cycles will only include the lithosphere and sometimes even the hydrosphere and it generally does not accommodate the atmosphere. Very rare cases do you have the atmosphere also included, but generally it is always the lithosphere will, which will all, uh, always act as the reservoir of the nutrients and include the hydrosphere in the cycle, but not the atmosphere always. So generally uh, the steps which are or the uh, uh, the steps itself which are actually in, included or involved in sedimentary cycles are erosion, sedimentation, mountain building, volcanic activity and biological transport. So you do have several sedimentary cycles but for us it will suffice if we discuss phosphorus cycle and sulphur cycle. So first I will take up or we will take up phosphorus cycle. Now, the reason we are actually discussing phosphorus cycle is due to the importance to life and certain other ecological phenomena. Now, phosphorus being a very reactive element is always found in the form of phosphate. So, I want you to remember certain points about phosphorus here. One, phosphorus is an essential nutrient for living organisms. I am pretty sure you know that there are certain important macromolecules such as DNA and RNA where phosphate actually forms a very important part of your DNA and RNA. The backbone of the DNA or the structure of the DNA contains phosphate. I am not saying that phosphate uh, makes up for the genetic information but makes up for your genetic structure that is the structure of the DNA or RNA. So phosphate is there in your DNA. Apart from that, I am pretty sure you would have heard of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that is energy for your cells. There also you have phosphate. Uh, all organisms which have a skeletal structure, calcium phosphate forms the supportive components which is important for our bones. So, it is essential part which is, so it forms an essential nutrient for our living organisms. Second, limiting nutrient. Now, I have already discussed what are, what are limiting factors, so I, should, I hope that you should be able to appreciate this particular concept here that phosphorus being scarce acts as a limiting factor and it is able to limit or support the growth of plants as well as organisms in fresh and aquatic ecosystems. That is why uh, in many of the fertilizers uh, used in agriculture in cultivation of land, uh, phosphorus is actually a very important component since it promotes plant growth and therefore it causes another big problem known as eutrophication. So phosphorus from fertilizers are carried away as runoff to lakes where they cause eutrophication which is nothing but overgrowth of algae which depletes oxygen from water and creates a dead zone. So at this stage you can just make a note of this particular concept. Uh, in detail we will discuss it later. So you can just make a note of it. Phosphorus causes eutrophication. Uh, the other point that I want you to remember is that plants take phosphorus from the soil and when we eat plants phosphorus is introduced into our system. That is how phosphorus is present in our bodies. Okay, so 
I hope you should be able to relate to this particular diagram or cycle which is shown here as I go on through the explanation. So you can just relate, try and relate to it. See, the main storage for phosphorus is the earth's crust where it occurs as a mineral in phosphate rocks and enters the cycle from erosion and mining activities. After being eroded, after, after weathering and erosion, it may be carried away through erosion that is by say rainwater from where it enters rivers and streams. These rivers and streams will carry it to lakes and oceans. Now, once it reaches the ocean, phosphorus starts to accumulate on continental shelves in the form of insoluble deposits. And millions of years later, when the crustal plate rises due to tectonic activity from the seafloor, it once again gets exposed where phosphates are now available on land. So weathering, erosion will once again release phosphorus and this continuous cycle will go on. I hope you this is clear to you. So this forms a part of the geocycle in phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus is there in the earth's crust, uh, in rocks. It gets weathered and eroded. Rainwater will carry it off and dump it in rivers or lakes. The rivers and streams will take it to oceans. It gets accumulated in the continental shelf. The continental shelf will store it for millions of years. Then once again due to tectonic activity, the continental shelf is uplifted. Once again, weathering and erosion will release phosphorus into the ecosystem. That is your terrestrial ecosystem or even your aquatic ecosystem for that sake. And this cycle will continue. So this is your geo cycle. At the same time, we can have phosphorus in the bio cycle. So what happens is, I have already told you, plants actually make use of phosphorus from the soil which is available. Plants use it. And when we uh, organisms eat producers, I mean herbivores, carnivores, uh, I mean herbivores eat uh, producers, the primary producers and carnivores would eat the, uh, would eat the herbivores and that is how phosphorus gets introduced into our system. So when animals excrete or when plants and animals die, phosphates may be taken up by detritivores or returned to the soil. So this is how this cycle of phosphorus also continues. So I want you to remember that phosphorus actually plays a very important role in our ecosystem, especially the aquatic ecosystem. So here uh, you can just pause this particular uh, I mean, at this particular time, you can just pause pause the video and just go through the four points. It is nothing but what I have already explained. You can just make note of these four, four points. Next, we'll move on to sulfur cycle. Now, very simple sulfur cycle is also more or less similar to phosphorus cycle as well. Now, sulfur, since it is a part of the sedimentary cycle, sulfur is also stored in soil and sediments where it is found in organic deposits like coal, oil and peat and inorganic deposits such as in rocks in the form of sulphates and sulphites. Sulphur is then released by weathering of rocks similar to your phosphorus cycle itself. So this sulphur is also weathered, is released by weathering of rocks, erosional runoff and decomposition of organic matter and hence it enters the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem. Sulphur may also be released into the atmosphere by volcanic eruptions, burning of fossil fuels or decomposition of organic molecules where certain gases may be released. Now here I want you to appreciate the difference between the phosphorus cycle and the sulphur cycle. Now both phosphorus cycle and sulphur cycle even though they are a part of the sedimentary cycles, phosphorus never enters the atmosphere. But when it comes to your sulphur cycle, I just said that sulphur is released into the atmosphere. Even though the reservoir is the uh, lithosphere, sulphur does enter the atmosphere. But the atmosphere is not the reservoir and therefore it is a part of the sedimentary cycle. So I'll just repeat it. This sulphur, after weathering of rocks, it may be carried away by rainwater and then it enters the terrestrial or ecosystem or even due to decomposition of organic matter, sulphur may be released into the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem. That is nothing but the lithosphere and the hydrosphere. At the same time, burning of fossil fuels, volcanic eruptions, certain gases released during decomposition of organic compounds or molecules may also release sulphur into the atmosphere. So this is how 
sulfur gets introduced into the ecosystem now once it gets introduced into the ecosystem obviously it will have to be brought back so if sulfur is released into the atmosphere this sulfur is uh, this sulfur actually gets oxidized to form sulfur dioxide and this sulfur dioxide dissolves in rain water to form a weak sulfuric acid and comes back as acid rain so i'm pretty sure you would have heard of acid rain and the adverse effects of acid rain this also we can take it up later in our lecture series but at this particular stage you can just make a note of it that sulfur returns or completes this cycle as it comes back to the uh, uh, to the earth's surface in the form of acid rain from the atmosphere and therefore the cycle is completed so if sulfur is released it gets deposited on land through four ways it could be through precipitation it could be through direct fallout from the atmosphere it could be through rock weathering or it could be through geothermal vents and therefore this particular geo cycle gets completed now just like your phosphorus cycle we will also have a biological a cycle of sulfur so i told you plants will also make use of sulfur so what happens is plants will absorb sulfur in the form of amino acids which then gets incorporated into proteins the organic form of sulfur is then consumed by animals as food and therefore it enters the food chain now and is successively followed or goes up the food chain finally when the animals die sulfur is released back to the terrestrial or aquatic ecosystem or again sometimes to the atmosphere in the form of gases and this cycle always continues so even if this is not clear maybe you can just use any source or any book use a diagram along with the diagram just go through the cycle once again it should be pretty clear to you you just have to remember that you'll have a biological cycle where the sulfur gets introduced into the food web or the food chain and when and once the organisms die uh, the sulfur gets deposited back into the eco, uh, uh, into the lithosphere or if sometimes even the hydrosphere and you can also have sulfur which is released from rocks and it will travel through the atmosphere for example and through acid rain it will come back it will once again get deposited and such cycles will always continue so this is nothing but the sulfur cycle so uh, this is nothing but an example of the different kind of questions that you might get in environment and ecology from various uh, subjects now this is this is a very good example where different concepts are actually included and you have a single question so this question is not only from your uh, functions of the ecosystem that is your nutrient cycle but different topics are included so the uh, the question says with reference to agricultural soils consider the following statements so the first statement says a high content of organic matter in soil drastically reduces its water holding capacity no when the organic content humus uh, organic matter increases in soil the water holding capacity also increases it does not reduce therefore the first statement is wrong the second statement says soil does not play any role in the soil in the sulfur cycle now we have already discussed this i did tell you i specifically mentioned that soil sorry uh, sulfur is present in the soil that is how plants take up sulfur therefore the second statement is also wrong the third statement says irrigation over a period of time can contribute to saline uh, can contribute to salinization of some agricultural lands yes this is a very big problem in india there are regions where you don't have enough water for cultivating land and there are regions where excess water is wasted and lands are flooded with excessive water where the salt contained in this water gets deposited and therefore the salinity of soil actually increases so the third statement is actually right and therefore the correct option is b three only so i hope you understood uh, <coughs> sedimentary cycles uh, whereas in the next video we'll take up gaseous cycles if you do have any doubts please write in the comment section thank you